It's great to have you here. This has been a phenomenal celebration of 41 at 100. One of the greatest gene pools in the world happens to be the Bush gene pool. And we are fortunate to have recipients in the gene pool come and talk to us what it means to be a grandchild of 41. He didn't have 41 grandchildren, he had 17. And we're blessed to have the following grandchildren here to talk with us today. George P., Walker, Ellie, Sam, Gigi, Pierce, Robert, and Lauren. So without further ado, but 41 claps for grandchildren. Howdy. Really great to be here. Uh, before we get started, I have to say a couple thank yous, especially to Andy Card and the foundation staff for putting on such a great week. We also have to thank our sponsors, uh, Bob Gates and Ryan Lance for putting this together. This would not be possible without them. It, a lot goes into this, um, and so we're grateful that they supported us through this 4100. So give it up for them too, please. <laughs> All right, well, my name is Sam LeBlond. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be hosting this Cousins panel today. Very excited, and really excited especially because of the topic. Well, one, my grandparents, who we love so much, but also serving others. And I'm sitting here at a panel with a lot of uh, cousins who had a lot of great service-related uh, activities, and I can't wait for you guys to hear about them. But we have to talk about some first, because we're all still kind of a little rattled. Um, <laughs> I have to admit, um, we all just jumped out of a plane to honor our crazy grandfather. Um, <laughs> we, were, we were joking earlier, it's too bad in the 70s he couldn't have taken up, you know, backgammon or something. We could have had a backgammon tournament in his honor instead of jumping out of a plane, but uh, very happy to do it. And so before we get started, I want to kind of, maybe someone here can explain to the group one, why our grandfather decided to take up skydiving in the 70s. And two, what did Ganey think about that? So, I don't know. Any, Rob, you want to start yeah. off? I know you're going to have... Yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, Sam. Um, that, <laughs> ton of fun out there today. Absolute blast getting to skydive. And I think, uh, thinking about it, I think what Gampy, why he kind of began doing it, uh, was, was really uh, to be able to bring together friends and family to have a shared experience that's... Um, just a total blast. And then, you know, ha now having done it, I think Gamps was a bit of an adrenaline junkie as well. I don't <laughs> think there's any denying that because it's a total thrill uh, to be able to do it with the, the all veterans group. And, um, you know, he, he, the Golden Knights, I think Gamps loved his relationship with them and to keep tabs on them. Um, and then as he got older, you know, just proved that old guys could still do some really cool things. Uh, you know, classic example of that would be Lud Ashley and he doing it together on their 80th birthday. Um, so I think all those things kind of rolled into it. Certainly. And, you know, I think we, someone else caught the bug. They're not on the, on the stage right now, but Andy Carr jumped and he said he wanted to do it again. <laughs> you want to say, yeah, Lauren, please. No, 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 but I think it was partly, too. So he obviously parachuted during World War II. He had to, out of necessity. So I feel like in part of him doing it time and again was sort of like to remember his, you know, crewman who didn't make it and kind of relive that moment, obviously in a much safer <laughs> uh, environment. But we were so blessed to go 20 years ago, or many, most of us on the stage. I think Gigi was a little too young then. Um, to go with him when he turned 80, and yeah, what a thrill. 20 years later to remember Gampy and get up there again. I've made the declaration that I think I'm retiring, unless he comes, he, he makes another ask from the grave for me to do it again. I don't think he's going to, but that's it for me. I think I'm retiring. Andy Card can take it from here. Um, <laughs> all right, so, you know, our, grandpa uh, our grandparents lived their lives with service as their core value. Um, and we were so lucky to see firsthand how serving others 
And it was not just something they talked about. They didn't really talk about it that much. They just did it. Um, and uh, many are familiar with their service to the country, I'm sure. Um, but we got to see simple acts of service every single day. Um, so my question to the team here, team of cousins, how did Gampy and Ganey's lifetime of service impact you? Um, did it help guide you to your current job or passion? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick it to our senior member, George P. Maybe you could uh, start us off and, and talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. Um, I, my first memory was when I was three years old and um, Gampy was running for president in 1979. He announced a memorial park on the west side of Houston and I've got a photo of me holding a balloon saying George Bush for president on it. Um, so needless to say, I mean, politics is, you know, kind of the family, um, the family uh, profession to a certain extent. I mean, um, since that time, just so many great campaigns and just great experiences, uh, whether watching uh, the Oak Ridge Boys and, and other performers that kind of paid homage last night um, to just kind of simple acts, uh, like you said, of, of volunteerism. I mean, I remember when Gampy uh, won, there was this large earthquake in, uh, uh, in, in Armenia. And in order to build better relations with uh, you know, the Soviets at the time, they wanted, he wanted to show American compassion and sent uh, a convoy of uh, Texans and Americans that supported AmeriCares to deliver much needed medical supplies. And so initially he commissioned dad to do it and then dad wanted me to, to join. And um, here we were behind the Iron Curtain delivering uh, American supplies. Um, you know, it's so, it's, it's beyond kind of just running for office and the, the electioneering of it. Many of you advanced for him and helped him get votes. Uh, but there's the aspect of, of serving as well when you're in, in, in office that he took so seriously that was uh, infectious and I think inspired so many other Americans to choose public service as a career. Yeah. And I know a lot of us here on this panel have chosen to do some things because maybe from the influence, but also because, you know, we love serving other people. But I was hoping maybe someone else could talk a little bit about that impact that Gampy and Ganey's, you know, uh, example had on maybe pointing you in the direction to serve others. Pierce, you want to? You wanna... <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of us here, Siv, so you got to call us out. Sorry. So, um, you know, I've been the CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters for nine years here in Texas, and I started as a volunteer. I never dreamed I would work there. I signed up to, to mentor a kid right when I graduated from college, college which I will not say here in Aggieland. Uh, <laughs> TU, I think they call it around here. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but, you know, uh, my whole life, I think all of our lives, we witnessed um, an amazing ability of both of our grandparents um, to, to build and foster and maintain relationships with others. Um, obviously, when our grandfather was president, that was put to very good use. Um, he built the world's largest coalition that, that has ever been built to push Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. He ended the Cold War through really a, a force of personality relationship with Mikhail Gorbachev. And uh, that happened without, um, without a bullet being fired. The Berlin Wall, the reunification of Germany, now one of our strongest allies, all of that was through these innate gifts of, of humanity that Gampy just possessed at his core. But we also saw it, I think, um, through relationships that they built um, and maintained that really last lifetimes. I think, of course, of Don Rhodes, um, who joined one of my grandfather's congressional campaigns in like the 60s and never left his side. A guy raised with a really tough, tough childhood. Ended up being one of my grandfather's best friends. You know, everybody thinks of James Baker and Bob Mossbacker, and those were some of my grandfather's best friends too, but Don Rhodes or pa Paolo Rendon, who uh, came over to this country on a work visa in 1958 and was with them till their death, lived in the White House. Um, just amazing stories. We, I went to her funeral, by the way, a few right after Gampy died, and every single one of her family came up and just, I mean, they're or part of the same family, basically. So, long story short, in my own way, Sam, I, I noted that, and I thought, what a blessing it is to be related 
uh, to George and Barbara Bush to be the grandson. So I signed up to become a mentor and like everything in life, and I think Gampy understood this fundamentally, when you sign up to give of yourself to someone else, you get so much more in return. First of all, when I met Jalen, um, I remember walking and thinking I was gonna help you know, navigate a, a kid, go to college and all that. And I, I realized I was so naive because the minute I met him, um, I took him to the zoo and he was six years old at the time. And again, not, I was not working for the agency. I was working in the energy business actually at the time uh, and walked up to the ticket counter lady and she, uh, you know, Jalen hands her the ticket and he looks her in the eye and said, I know what you're thinking. I got real good looking eyebrows, don't I? <laughs> And uh, it made me realize I was, I was 23 at the time. I was probably gonna get pickup advice from this guy to help me in my single days. And sure enough, I see my mother-in-law here. <laughs> uh, like six years later, I ended up meeting my wife who was a volunteer in the program. And uh, you know, it's just amazing. And Gampy and Ganey understood so much that when you sign up to do something for someone else, you get 10 to 100 action return. Thank you, Pierce. You know, I, I mentioned those simple acts of service, and you know, I think, you know, this panel, you know, we have at least a hundred each of these kind of examples of, of Gampy and Ganey, and you know, even though they serve the public, um, you know, through their positions in government and with um, their numerous foundations, and they also made time to serve their family, friends, and community. Um, so I would love to share. I would love to, and, you know, when they did all that stuff, guess what? No, no, no fanfare, no press. Um, luckily, we were there. So I was hoping someone on, uh, so, so we could give some examples of some of these simple acts of kindness that I think really inspired us a lot. I mean, yes, of course, being president was amazing. Um, but they did it all the time. So I was wondering if anybody on the, on the panel here has an example of one of those simple acts of service. Ellie. I do, yes. Uh, I came prepared. Um, <clears throat> so. I, I don't, I hope this counts as an act of service, but it's something that really just meant so much to me. I'm pulling up my phone because it's a letter that I wanted to read um, that Gampy wrote to me when I was in college and it was a particular semester that I had just, a, I was having a rough time. And I remember I went home, I think it was over Christmas break and I was just telling my mom and I was just so down, down in the dumps and, and um, one day in the mail, I got a letter from Gampy, totally unexpected, and I just wanted to share it with you because it, I, you know, it just meant so much to me. It still means so much to me, and it's just the little, little things he would do um, like this. So he said, so this is December 3rd, 2007. Okay, hold on. Oh, gosh, okay. Did you need someone else to read it? I can't read it. Just like, I didn't get one word out. Okay. <laughs> Whew. Okay, dear, special, wonderful Ellie. Unfortunately, I'll give you a second to recover. Oh, we have a gene. We also developed a service gene, but also a crying gene from Gampia. So, no, work no, with us. I mean, we always joke that we have the, the tear ducts of Sicilian grandmothers. So, just <laughs> can't, we can't help it. Anyway, okay, dear special wonderful Ellie, your mom told me you tried to call me, and she told me what it was about. My <laughs> okay. My message back to you is that I love you. <laughs> I'm proud of you. I'm so sorry, and I'll always be in your corner. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Ooh, oh man. Okay, Sicilian the time grandma, is, right? Time's ticking down. It's okay. good. We need, we need to kind of, yeah, it's good. It's helping us. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. We all hit bumps in the road of life, but you will get past this bump and go on to great things. Here are some worry beads. If you ever worry, rub these beads and the worries should fade away. Also, you can pawn them if you go broke in Tanzania. <laughs> <laughs> As Dora once asked, are they real? Well, they are. So if you need a Starbucks double latte mocha special, pedal them. <laughs> One last point, if you ever need a shoulder to cry on, an arm to lift you up in the years ahead, or just plain someone to say, I love you, Ellie, I'm demand. Also, if you need <laughs> if you need a back to rub, I am demand. <laughs> and I pay folding green. Good luck in your fascinating life ahead. Out of difficulties come new exciting challenges. <laughs> okay. You will do well with that, I'm sure. Devotedly Gampy. Okay. Woo! Woo. Man, yeah. You know, we, 
we, I read that a few times before and had no tears, so yeah, I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> the pressure of all the people here watching. No. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny that you, you talk about his letters, and, and that was one of the ways that he really impacted everyone. I think probably a lot of people in this room got a letter from George H.W. Bush, and, you know, I have tons of them, and it's great to, you know, have that connection with somebody who has so many friends, and he had all the time in the world to take time for us. So, Gigi, are you ready? I know you were going to do yeah, something geez. next, but she's... I mean, okay, mine's not as, not as much of a Good, good, let's bring it back. when it comes oh, to, small, to small acts of service, I mean, Gampy and Ganny really integrated that into their everyday life, and I remember being up in Maine and Ganny bringing some of us. I went with her to the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital just to go visit some of the children, um, patients, or um, someone last night touched on Gampy shaving um, his head, one, one of his agent's sons was diagnosed with leukemia. Just small things like that that they, they did and, you know, did so regularly and really impacted, I think, all of us. And um, so just remember those small moments. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I'm on my way to Maine tomorrow um, because Maine's great, but also um, <laughs> because um, we're going to have the Bush Family Classic Golf Tournament. And... What's so interesting about that tournament is that it, 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 it uh, 100% of the proceeds of our tournament go to the Gary's house. And Gary's house was one of those things that, you know, was not on anybody's radar until it was on George Bush's radar. And, uh, you know, we're, we're so excited to be able to... <laughs> God, geez, we, why, am I the, why am I the moderator? Okay. Um, we're, so <laughs> we're so excited to be able to take these small causes that Gampy has made into huge causes, and we raise almost half the money for Gary's house in this one event. And so, you know, these are the small little things that Gampy has taken on in Ganny um, that we're so proud to take on uh, ourselves, you know, carry the mantle, as this is called. So, um, really, really exciting. Pierce, you, you put your hand up, you're no, doing tears. Like Tear yeah. man, okay, good. Oh no, I'll say one small yeah, yeah, please. because I see Soli over here. Yeah, Soli. This is a typical George H.W. Bush story. When my grandmother died, they had two dogs that were, Gampy called them two little yappers. Whew. Brutal. I mean, they were, yeah, they were tough dogs. Minnie Mini and BB. Yeah, Minnie and BB. But Gampy actually ended up loving them. And at the time when he died, he really was not, you know, very mobile and needed a service dog. And so, so his aide, Evan Sicily, said, look, why don't we partner with this organization? At first, he was against it because he said, I have two dogs. I don't need another dog. And then he very quickly understood, to your point, Sam, that him having solely and being matched up with the American Vets Service Organization would probably benefit a lot of other military <laughs> uh, personnel who needed them. And <laughs> <laughs> you have to understand, we're all very tired. There's, we had to wake up early. Yeah, big endorphin Campy, dump. Yeah, Campy I'm also not. called it, he said he was the captain of the Bush Ball Club, B-A-W-L. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but that's a small, I mean, just, just the small thing. What's it, and then that was the last we ever saw Mimi and Bibi. Nobody knows what happened to her, yeah. but we know about Sully. Sully yeah. made it to the, to the 100th birthday. Sully keeps showing. Sully's invited. I don't think Mimi and Bibi are. Um, okay. <laughs> well, well, I think uh, as I looked, uh, you know, across the panel here, um, uh, you know, I see so many different examples of how you guys have taken those lessons from both Gampy and Ganny and served others in your own unique ways. Um, whether it be through service to your country, like Walker and George P., um, you know, uh, service-related businesses or foundations, serving your communities. We run the gamut here. Um, so I would love to, to have some of our, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a George, uh, Walker, please, to start and talk about, you know, what are the ways you served? Obviously, you're serving the country. And how did Gampy and Ganny's uh, example kind of lead you down that path? So, Walker, why don't you start off? Yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, uh, growing up with a grandfather, like we had, um, I mean, he's, he's a hero to the country, but he was also a hero to all of us, and he took so much time out of, you know, his schedule to focus on each of us all the time and maintain individual relationships with all of us. And so having that hero, I kind of you know, always had an idea of um, service to country in some form or fashion. And after, after high school, a year at another Texas school, um, <laughs> yeah, up, up north, um, I decided that I was going to join the Marine Corps. And 
So joined the Marine Corps and uh, became a machine gunner and deployed. And one of the most important things to me was going back and showing my grandfather what I had accomplished. And after Afghanistan having some troubles, he pulled me in and told me his story and his way of coping with some of the things that he coped with. Um, and I don't know if, if he ever talked about that with anybody else. I, I had certainly never heard it before, but um, you know, just those, those individual relationships and the simple things that he did with all of us was so important that we wanted to do things in our lives to make him proud. Um, and so that was, that was my way of not only giving back to him, but to our country as well. Yeah, thank you. Robert. Well, for me, it was um, you know well after 9/11. It was 06, I believe, when um, Gampy was the first president to have the honor of having an aircraft carrier named in his uh, in his in his honor during his lifetime. Usually, it's done posthumously, and so I remember going to to Damneck and um, you know visiting with some of the sailors and just kind of probing questions. It was something that I had been thinking about. I served in the federal judiciary. I was out of law school, you know, thinking about different options. And um, long story short, you know, talked to a recruiter and said, um, I want to join. And uh, got my direct, direct commission, initially recruited as a JAG. My JAG friends said, uh, including many Aggies, that said, uh, don't do it, go into Intel. Um, and, and that was kind of the, the branch that, that I chose. But, um, you know, like Walker, for me, you know, it was about service to the country, but there was a deeper um, part of me that wanted to, to just honor my grandfather in a really small uh, way of, of service. And so um, 10 years of reserves and a deployment later, I was um, to proud, proud to serve. My wife, unfortunately, said uh, after 10 years with two kids on the ground, it's either the Navy or me. So um, <laughs> I, I chose her. Smart choice. Smart choice. Thank you, George. Well, you know, Walker and, and, and George so honorably served our country, and, and there's other ways that we uh, show that service to others. And I was hoping to kick down to Lauren because Lauren has an amazing organization, and I'd love for her to tell you all about what she does at FEED. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> um, yeah, so honored to be here. Thank you all for joining to celebrate our Gampy. Uh, my journey to starting FEED started when I was in college. I had the opportunity to travel uh, with the UN World Food Program. But even before that, I feel like our grandparents did sort of instill us with this, they weren't prescriptive about how you were to give back, but they really lived by this quote that is, um, to, to whom much is given, much is expected. Um, and I just feel like that was just the influence we had and it was never, hey, Walker, you better go serve in the military or here, Lauren, this is, you know, you're expected to give back or do good in some way. Um, so I really, I appreciate um, the freedom they gave us to sort of finding our own path to, to, to figuring out what, you know, cause or what, you know, mission we wanted to be on personally and kind of what personal passion and, and ideas and, and talents that we could bring to that. So for me, it was um, the issue of hunger and I had early exposure when I was in college via the UN World Food Program and just came back from that, those travels and that experience um, you know, literally seeing children just because of where they're born are born into a life where their next meal is not guaranteed. And that was so far from the life I was so blessed to have been born into. Um, and at the same time, I love fashion and design and kind of had this aha moment to create uh, the feedback program that is a way to raise money and awareness and help sort of fundraise. Um, and just, yeah, some of my most proud like early moments with Feed were just Ganny carrying her feed bag around and sending me pictures of her on her like daily walks around her neighborhood with her little feed bag in tow. And just, you know, having her be proud of me and having Gampy be proud of me was, yeah, just truly meant so much. Um, and I, I, again, I, I love that our grandparents gave us space enough to, I think, figure out what our own pa personal passions and like interests were and pursue those. Um, and yet, led by example, because we just saw how much joy that they got out of on a daily basis in big and small ways in giving back and like making people smile and making their days better. Um, so 
hopefully we're all you know able to channel that every day. Great. Well, hold on a second. Before we clap about Lauren's amazing feed uh, organization, I, I needed to brag a little bit. So um, first, has anybody seen the beautiful bags that she has for, for us here? Aren't those great? <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then also, uh, can you tell us how many people you fed? We've been able to provide over 127 million school 127 meals. million people. Um, and, you know, besides, you know, all the wonderful things you've heard already, we have such great opportunity to serve others through the foundations that Gampy and Ganny have left behind. So we have members of the Barbara Bush Foundation up here. We have uh, George and Barbara Bush Foundation. Uh, we have the Points of Light Foundation members. Um, so we're so lucky to be able to use these amazing foundations that they've left behind to do a lot of good. And the good thing about that is that they gave us a really good head start. <laughs> They work really hard on it. Um, so we're really excited to be able to do that. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think we'll move on to uh, kind of the why, because you know, we've heard it, we've seen them do it, but why the heck are they doing this? You know? And so um, I was hoping someone here on, on the panel could kind of explain why Gampy and Ganny love serving others so much and why it was so important to them, um, and maybe even parlay it and why it became important to you. Um, and so, you know, I can start out um, because I see some kind of some, some stares at me here. We did prep a little bit, guys. But, uh, um, you know, f for me, it goes back to those simple acts of service. But Ganey and Gampy truly loved helping people. And it wasn't just, you know, the, oh, here comes the you know, Japanese prime minister. Let's turn it on. It was all the time. And uh, so uh, there's a great story, um, and I'm probably going to get it wrong, and there's so many experts in here that are going to probably uh, fix it uh, after this thing. But there was a great story about Gampy when he went to visit the Queen of England. And he walked into the Queen of England. You know, the guards are sitting there on the side. And you're not supposed to look at them. You're not supposed to talk to them. And he stopped at the guards to shake their hands on the way in. <laughs> I mean, who does that, right? So, uh, you know, for, for me, it's, you know, he was always thinking about the other person, and it didn't matter who that other person was. Um, does anybody else have any thoughts about the why, you know? I mean, Gampy and Ganny, George, I think you're, you're looking at me. Well, I'll, I'll just say that I, I think for Gampy, he felt like he was raised, and I think we all agree, in the greatest country that the world has ever seen. That has given him... Um, that, that has uh, given him so much and that he felt like he needed to give back to. So, I mean, why else would somebody at, rightfully at the age of 16 enter a naval recruiting station and say, I'm going to serve this country when he had a, a world of different options. Um, and then when he got in the Studebaker, which I think is still in the library, and drove down to West Texas to pursue the, uh, the black gold and the desolate sands of West Texas. I mean, it's, um, it's a remarkable story. At, you know, I almost feel like, and I shouldn't say this in front of people in the private sector, but it was really a means to an end to serve. Uh, if you look at the life that, and that he and Ganny put in, it was really a long path, a long journey to surf at the highest level possible. I think, you know, John Meacham the other day really spoke to that, that, you know, I think we should be honest that he, you know, for anybody who's offering themselves at the highest office of land, they have to have some level of ambition, but he wanted to use it for good. And I think that's what separates him, especially during this time and this era, in so many different areas of our government. But I would, I think, for Gampy's perspective, that's why he felt the drive just nonstop to to serve until the end. I've got another one. You know, I I think the the most simple answer I could give is because it's the right thing to do. Um, I you know I think every day all of his decisions were were based on you know it's the right thing to do. I had a company commander that always used to end his briefs with live your life above reproach. And um, it always resonated with me because I felt that that is how my grandfather lived. Um, and I think it's, you know, uh, in addition to that, I think a lot of it is he just genuinely loved his fellow man. Um, and I think that's, it's a testament to how many friends um, he maintained along the way and, and how many people, you know, love him and, and appreciate the things that he did. Great. Well, I want to end. Uh, we have a couple more th uh, questions here, and then we're going to end with some fun. But 
The last question I have kind of service related is, is kind of for advice because I, I feel like, um, you know, maybe there's people here who, who are inspired to get started in public service and, you know, my question to, to, to the team here is, uh, you know, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to get started in public service? How did they get started? What do they do? <laughs> Lauren, Lauren, get in there, Lauren. No, I think it, it has to be obviously such a personal calling, but I would say there's not a one size fits all. We live in such a divisive, noisy time that I think it's turning a lot of people, rightly so, off from public service. And I would just encourage people to kind of find their own path towards it, no matter what age you are, no matter what you have to give, like we all have something to give. Um, and we can all, yeah, serve in our own ways. So it doesn't have to be this sort of gargantuan, like, life dedication, the way we're talking about with my grandfather, which, if it is, then amazing. But I think it can also be sort of these smaller acts of service that we take on, or a single project that, like Pierce, can become a full-time career. Um, so just kind of figure out the starting point and don't let it overwhelm you. Apply to the Bush School. I would, I would say, uh, I totally agree with Lauren, you know, and I think Gamp and Ganey would agree that politics isn't the only way to serve. When you look at Points of Light and the variety of other community groups they were involved in, there's so many different ways to, to get in there. If you are interested in politics, jump in a campaign. I, I think that's the best advice you can. Get in with, um, you know, campaign, learn the experience, you know, um, look me up in Austin, I'll hook you up in the Capitol. Um, get involved in a legislative session. I mean, that's really... I think the best way to see government in, in, um, in action, but I, I'm biased. I think the Bush School is the best grad school that brings together theory and practice because you, you learn from actual practitioners, both in intelligence, government. Um, and one final example I'll share is that in response to Hurricane Harvey, where 20,000 homes were impacted by the most devastating storm in Texas state history, we hired numerous Bush School grads to come to the fight because Aggies know to run to the fight, not away from the fight. And uh, I'll never forget that. So, um, so find, find your path, find your uh, joy, and, and pursue it, and go to the Bush School. I love it. I love it. Good plug, George P. Um, okay, so we got about 15 to 20 minutes left, and I thought we'd end with some fun. Um, you know, Gampy and Ganny certainly had uh, service in common, but they also had another trait, humor. Okay, so I was thinking, since we have some people with some stories that maybe no one's heard before. We could tell some uh, stories about Gampy and Ganny, um, and maybe I'll lead off, since I haven't said much yet. <laughs> Just kidding, I've said a lot. But I'll lead off because I, I, I think there's some great stories that, that everyone wants to hear. So, so my story has to do with Gampy spreading love, spreading joy. And uh, you know, one of the things that he loved to do is, is have guests come visit him at Walker's Point. And uh, one of those guests who became a friend was a guy named Phil Nicholson. You might have heard of him, left-handed golfer. Um, and so what Gampy used to love to do was take all these guests out on his boat, the Fidelity. He'd scare them half to death, going 80 miles an hour, and then uh, we'd take it back through the Kenny Bunk River and, 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 and put it back in its slip. And on this occasion, with Phil Mickelson, it was a beautiful day, Saturday, middle of the day in Kenny Bunk Port, wedding season. Okay, so we, we hit Kenny Bunk River, and the first thing we see is the Nonantum on the right, and there's a wedding going on. Well, Gampy thinks it's a great idea to pull up to the wedding. And he thought it was so much fun, because everyone sees his boat. His boat's very well known in Kenny Bunk Port. So they go, oh my gosh, the president's coming. And the joy that he had to go, everybody, Phil Mickelson's here. You should have seen the faces. I mean, they're melting into a puddle. So not only do we do that at the Nonantum, we got back in the boat after taking pictures and doing all this stuff. There was another wedding. We stopped at that one too, and we did the whole thing. This is Phil Mickelson, and everyone went, oh my gosh. But Gampy, I mean, it was just amazing. I mean, he had meetings and stuff to do, but he's stopping and crashing weddings on his boat with Phil Mickelson. It was unbelievable. So I loved that wedding. I was kind of a fly on the wall and uh, got to watch that. But he just loved bringing people joy. And he knew that, you know, especially with Phil Mickelson in tow, it was a joyous occasion for these weddings. And they will never forget the president pulling up on a boat. So I love that story. And uh, now it's for the world. 
So who else has a great story? Rob? Yeah, I, I got a story. And I, I apologize. This is going to be uh, slightly juvenile. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But, but, uh, but Gampy's humor was slightly juvenile from time to time. So um, this was probably, I don't know, 20 years ago. I was probably uh, 10 years old. And my mom, Doro, uh, my Gigi and I went out to dinner with a cousin from out of town, Max. Uh, we went to this great place in, in Cape Porpoise called The Wayfarer. Great restaurant. It's no longer there, sadly. But uh, Max uh, wasn't feeling so well that day. And, uh, you know, he's kind of having some rumbles in his stomach. Uh, <laughs> Max would be so embarrassed if I tell this story. But <laughs> next thing you know, a, a loud noise kind of protruded from Max's side of the table. He farted. And <laughs> it was actually... The whole restaurant kind of turned and looked and, you know, baby started crying, the whole thing. I, I, of course, thought it was, you know, the funniest thing that had ever happened. My poor cousin Max is just mortified, you know, total accident situation. And um, anyway, next morning, my mom kind of lets Gampy in on what had happened and Gamp Gampy thought it was very funny. And, uh, you know, we had no idea. A couple later, a couple hours later, we, we, the phone rings, and I answer, and it's uh, it's either Gene Becker or someone from Gampy's office, and they say, uh, the president would like to see you and your cousin Max in his office immediately. <laughs> and so <laughs> we go down there. Gampy sits us down. We're kind of like, what the heck's going on here? This is bizarre. Um, but, you know, Ellie shared a, a really sweet letter earlier, but Gampy also kind of liked to write prank letters. <laughs> and so he, he said, I got this, this letter from the management team of the Wayfair <laughs> in the mail this morning. And I'm, I'm not sure if you guys know anything about this. I'm, I'm just going to read it. And, and the letter goes on. He's reading it to us. Dear Mr. President, it's come to our attention that some of your guests were dining at the Wayfair last evening. And one of them in particular made a uh, rather loud disturbance. <laughs> and the letter goes on, the letter goes on, and you know, Max and I are sitting there ghost white, like, oh my God, we're in so much trouble. And at the end of the letter, Gampy, deadpan the whole time, finally breaks on the line when he says, if you could please inform your guests to politely lift their cheek the next time. <laughs> Gampy absolutely lost it at that point, and we, and we knew it was a joke, but um, <laughs> I, th I think there's countless examples of him doing the prank letter as well. That was, that was just one that, time where he hit, hit us with it. That's great. That's great. Okay, who, uh, it's a tough act to follow. Anybody else have one they want to? Yeah. George, I know you, oh, yeah, Ellie, Ellie. Very different kind of yeah. angle. It's shifting the gears? Um, it's not a flatulence story? No, but there, we, I'm sure there are more. Well, yeah. I, ha I could plenty of them. say one of those, but I'll, I'll do another one. Um, I remember, so um, there was a dinner, again, in Kenny Bungport, and uh, Christopher Buckley, who the, the author, was a good friend of Gany and Gampy's, and he was there with us, and my mom was there, and so I ended up at this dinner, and... Um, this was when, as my grandfather was getting older, and my grandmother, uh, there was a couple years where she was trying to sort of control what he, he ate and drank, because she wanted him to live longer, and, um, and he just wanted no part of that. Um, so we were at dinner, and it, he, you know, he loved his martinis, and she had like a one martini rule, like that's it. And so we got to the dinner, and he gets his martini, and kind of, you know, he would you know, wink at the waitress, you know, just like... You know, keep them coming. Yeah, bring it. Yeah, yeah, like a little, they had a little understanding. So, so um, as the dinner goes on, the, the waitress brings the second martini, and Ganny gives him, like gives the waitress the eyes and gives him the eyes, and, and he's just doing like it's it's okay, it's okay, and um, and then uh, yeah, I guess they had an understanding. So the so a third martini came, and at that point. So, oh no, you know what it was? Christopher Buckley, I'm sorry. Christopher Buckley was the one who was giving the waitress like the, you know, bring more kind of um, signal. And so finally, as, as the third martini comes, um, Ganny just ha absolutely had it. And so her hand, I'd never, never seen her do anything like this, but like slams her hand on the table and it's like, that's it. Like, absolutely not. Um, and Gampy, you know, Gampy's giving us all the winks like, yeah, don't worry, I got this. And, and um, so like funny little things like that, they would sort of go back and forth and uh, I think Gampy would always win those. They, there was also, um, not only with the martinis, there was, um, I think she had a limit on the bread rolls, the, the bread, the, the rolls that he could have because he would just keep them going and, you know, so it was, they had a, a very funny sort of um, back and forth with each other, especially in those 
um, later days. Yeah, imagine Barbara Bush as your caretaker. Look out. <laughs> well, I think, George P., I think maybe you have one to, to, to finish us off with here as our elder statesman and probably our most polished speaker. I think you should probably finish us off with maybe one story about Game Pierre Ganey, and we can call it a night. Um, well, I'd hate to leave the historians with a um, tainted perspective of the Bush family in light of our... Uh, a potty humor, but, um, and we did not collaborate on our answers, so this is totally independent. So I'm gonna tie three different themes in the same one, in this same joke. Um, Gampy, when he was in office, for some reason, had this fetish over the summer with whoopee cushions. <laughs> so you may remember that you've always heard about the Brent Scowcroft First to Sleep Award, uh, how we would compete, and with the grandkids, challenged us all to First to Bed Award, and now as a parent of two, I understand why now. Um, <laughs> And with the whoopee cushion, he would encourage us with relatives, several of whom I, I see here actually, uh, before they come to the table, to just kind of discreetly place it to try to get as large and as loud of an outburst out of the whoopee cushion as possible. But here I am as, I don't know, maybe nine, so I don't really have an understanding of global politics, let's just say. Um, and if I recall correctly, it was uh, Prime Minister John Major who, uh, <laughs> was uh, making a little visit to Kenny Bunkport. And um, sometimes I'd stay in the big house like on the second floor and you know, I'm just trying to find f fun things to do. So um, Gampy um, was entertaining the prime minister in kind of like the side room some of you all have been to. And um, I kind of discreetly put it down there. And Gampy comes out from the side room and he sees me doing it and he says, Prime Minister John Major's over there. Don't do that, don't do that. And that was it. <laughs> but that involves a martini, potty humor, the Brits, Chris, Chris, yeah, so I got it all together right there. How about that? Well, unless anybody's... The whoopee cushion ended up turning into an electronic one towards the end yeah, there. Yeah, he, he called it the fork machine, they called it. Was in, you know, gosh, we've really gone into the t toilet humor here. Well, yeah, exactly. low, low point. I'll say one yeah, more. Yeah, Pierce, story. have Pierce, you finish this off. Our second most polished. Okay, here we go. No. <laughs> I don't know about that. And it's not necessarily a story as much as I think it's just thematic and I think it's important to he he did not take himself that seriously. Um, and it's a lesson for us all. Um, and we gotta see it firsthand. He was very competitive, loved organizing co competition. I mean, every summer we would gather as a family and he would invite some friends um, and we'd have a backgammon tournament, for example. Um, I've, one of the people maybe sitting on the same couch once tossed a board on me. Uh, <laughs> but Gampy loved that kind of stuff. And at the end of the tournament, he would give awards to everybody. And he would, they were so well cast. And then he would always talk about, to, to avoid controversy, the ranking committee. Um, and then one summer, I remember coming back and we were on a boat and I see Gampy posing in bodybuilder photos and he has a like professional photographer taking pictures of him. And then later in the gym, there, there are pictures of him every summer in bodybuilding physique and it was just amazing. I mean, uh, he, he really enjoyed life, lived it to the fullest. And, uh, and it's just such a great lesson to life short. He wanted to live to be a hundred by the way. Um, Days before he died, um, James Baker asked him straight up. He said, do you want to be 100? He said, yeah. And he wanted to jump out of the plane. That's probably the main reason we all did it today. Um, Definitely. Uh, but he just thought life was, should be fun. And I think it's an it's in encouragement for all of us, in, especially in this time where people seem so angry. Gampy broke down so many barriers through his sense of humor, through his kindness, through his sense of decency, through his integrity, and through his love of humanity. Hmm. Thanks, Pierce. <laughs> That's That's well, well, on that note, he'd be really proud of all the fun we've been having this week, and I think we're going to have some fun tonight with Lyle Lovett and uh, Robert O'Keefe. So, with that being said, thank you all so much for being here. We love you. See you soon.